Hi, good evening, everybody. And welcome to the next uh, Marxist class in this wonderful series that we're, we're uh, hosting by the Education Department. Uh, tonight, we're going to be discussing the planetary emergency and the ecological crisis that we face. Uh, my name is John Bechtel. Um, I'm a member of the National Board of the Party and also uh, on the editorial collective of the People's World. I want to start with a disclaimer. Uh, there's so much to understand and grasp about this subject and we'll, we'll learn together. I'm not going to be able to present everything. I'll miss things. So if you um, you know, have a comment or you, you, know, you want to make a contribution, uh, we'll have an opportunity to do that, but feel free to speak up. And we're only going to scratch the surface. Uh, we won't be able to cover the science of the climate and ecological crisis. Um, we'll just briefly review the features of the crisis, the developing Marxist approach, and the tactics and strategy necessary to address the ecological and civilizational crisis. I have a little technical difficulty here, but okay. Anyway, we'll focus on the critical role of the working class um, and its allies in in this uh, in building a global solidarity in this fight. These are the things we'll cover. First part will be on the crisis itself. The Earth and its inhabitants face multiple ecological crises. Humanity and nature face a comprehensive crisis of all interrelated ecological systems that regulate the stability and resilience of the Earth's system. A group of scientists warned the other day that seven of eight critical planetary boundaries have been breached, creating immense harm to society. With the Global South, people of color, women, and poor communities hit the hardest. Consider just this year in Siberia, the hottest day recorded in history. In Canada, 28,000 square kilometers burned up in uh, wildfires. Uh, the, in Antarctic, uh, the Antarctic, a sea ice extent, the lowest on record in uh, It's estimated by uh, 2030, there won't be any uh, sea, sea, winter sea ice in, in the, um, the sea ice in the in the uh, Arctic. Uh, globally, the hottest May surface sea surface temperatures on record in Japan. 100 rainfall records were broken um, this year alone. The main crises are number one, the climate crisis, which is the sharpening sharpest edge of the crisis. affecting everything, disrupting interconnected global ecosystems, causing droughts, desertification, wildfires, massive flooding, and extreme, extreme weather events. The last nine years were the hottest on record in all of human history. Heat waves are hotter, they last longer, and are more frequent. And because of the presence of the El Nino effect, Meteorologists predict that 2023 will be among the top four hottest years on record. Meanwhile, catastrophic flooding occurred in Pakistan, covering one third of the country, affecting 33 million people. A historic Western US drought was followed by 12, what they call atmospheric rivers over Northern California, causing flooding and mudslides. Each river can carry more than 20 times the amount of water of the Mississippi River, but as vapor. Climate change is melting the polar ice caps, causing sea level rise and flooding. In 2022 alone, in 2022, the US alone, 
experienced 18 separate weather and climate disasters costing at least $1 billion each. That included Hurricane Ian, which killed 149 people around Florida. That number puts 2022 into a three-way tie with 2017 and 2011 for the third highest number of billion dollar disasters in the calendar year behind the 22 events in 2020 and 20 events in 2021. Over 5 million deaths per year are associated with ex excess heat and mm -hmm. cold temperatures. Health systems are ex experiencing enormous strains. In the US, death rates are highest among people of color and people living in poverty. Climate scientists say there is a 66% chance that the average global temperature will increase 1.5 degrees centigrade or 2.5, 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're already at 1.2 degrees seven, uh, centigrade increase over pre-industrial society temperatures, and that'll happen by 2027. That is, that is the threshold to avoid more catastrophic and irreversible changes to the Earth's environment in the next few years. The second uh, crisis that we wanna cover is the biodiversity crisis, what they call the sixth extinction crisis, which is also called the Anthropocene or human-made extinction crisis. Thousands and thousands of species are disappearing. Number three is the pollution and waste, pollution and waste in the air, land, water, and soil, plastic, garbage, fine particulate matter, and forever chemical. Fourth, the depletion of half the world's topsoil, resulting in decreased crop yields, soil erosion, increased use of chemical fertilizers, and their leaching into waterways and oceans. And number five, deforestation. Deforestation, the loss of 30% of the world's forests over 9,000 9, 9, years, and desertification, which greatly reduces carbon drawdown. The sixth major crisis, the crisis of the oceans, acidification, heating, massive dead zones from chemical fertilizer runoff, causing more frequent superstorms, powerful hurricanes and typhoon pollution, and the accumulation of plastics, up to 151 trillion pieces of plastics, and you're probably familiar with the great Pacific garbage patch. They're all as the, you take a look at these crises together, there's multiple positive feedback loops that are accelerating the ecological crisis, leading to greater ecosystem disruption and instability. For example, global warming is melting the Ar Arctic permafrost, unleashing massive amounts of stored up methane gas, the most powerful greenhouse gas, which once released goes into the atmosphere and further warms the planet. Because nature and society are a dynamic whole, this is a socio-ecological crisis. Environmental, animal, plant, and human health are all interlinked. Witness the COVID pandemic. Heat, humidity, extreme weather events, and sea level rise will displace hundreds of millions of people. Rising food insecurity and famine due to heat, drought, flooding, soil exhaustion, deforestation, 
development and falling crop yields. Sharpening conflicts are occurring over resources, water, cropland, fishing rights, essential minerals and raw materials. Extreme weather, water stress and war could displace 1.2 billion people in the poorest and most vulnerable countries, mainly in the global south by 2050, according to the Institute for Economics and Peace. Underlying the socio-ecological crisis is a rapidly evolving, hostile, destructive, and disruptive relationship between human civilization and the dominant cap mode of production and the rest of the universe. So that concludes part one of the presentation. So part two, we want to talk about Marxist ecology. Marxism and the historical, dialectical, materialist method are vital tools for scientists and ecologists and environmental justice organizers. Historical materialism encompasses the interrelationship of ecological systems and the dynamic oneness of the human civilization and nature. Marx and Engels' ecological writings on capitalism's destructive impact on the nature, on nature and society broaden our understanding of Marx's historical materialism. They are a basic contribution to the development of an expanding body of ecological Marxism. Their writings incorporated discoveries by Darwin and other scientists, observations on the environmental destruction of industrial manufacturing, and the, discover and the discoveries of Justus von Liebig, the German chemist and agronomist who studied the ecological destruction, disruption and unsustainability of early capitalist industrial agriculture. Marx increasingly examined the interconnection between modes of production and ecology, and Marx came to see the plunder of the natural environment as a manifestation of the central contradiction of capitalism. Marx understood humans, society, and nature are one dialectically interact and co-evolve together. Humans engage with nature through the labor process to live and reproduce life. Through this dialectical process, humans transform the environment, themselves, and society. Marx expressed this relationship between nature and humanity as metabolism, similar to a cell metabolism. Each mode of production metabolism to varying degrees. Capitalist mode of production unleashed destructive and self-destructive forces on a massive scale, remaking the environment on a global scale, creating a globalized metabolic rift, what he called a metabolic rift between nature and human civilization. The growing domination of global capitalism, the antagonistic relationship between town and country, urban and rural, the global concentration of wealth and power, climate apartheid and cl what they call climate apartheid and climate patriarchy, greater exploitation of labor and land, deepens and widens this metabolic rift between nature and society. Half of all greenhouse gas emissions are produced by seven countries, most of that by the US and China. Two thirds of the major industrial greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel use, methane leaks, and cement manufacture originate in just 90 transnational corporations, mostly from leading capitalist countries. Four banks dominate fossil fuel financing. These companies and banks outsource the pollution to the global south, and they, and they feel the worst effects which is why climate reparations must be a part of planetary just transition. 
Instead of referencing this epoch as the Anthropocene, that is the human cause um, extinction, Jason, Marxist Jason Moore suggests it is better understood as the capital Ocene, that humans in general are not responsible for the crisis, but capitalism as the dominant mode of production is the main transforming and destructive force of the web of life and the productive forces themselves. Oops, sorry about that. Why is capitalism so different? The capitalist mode of production is propelled by the insatiable drive for maximum profits and endless wealth accumulations. Corporations must expand or die. Capitalist profits are realized in the production process through the exploitation of labor and, and wealth accum, accum, accumulation accrues through the theft of unpaid work and unpaid nature. Labor and nature are commodified on a global scale. Humans are alienated from both labor and nature and the capitalist class plunders through militarized force on a global scale. The capitalist mode of production is degrading and disrupting nature's cycles and interrelated ecological and biosphere systems. And this destruction is accelerating. <clears throat> Capitalist production is consuming natural resources and destroying nature faster than it can re be replenished and regenerated, degrading the conditions of production and treating nature as an endless waste, waste sink. Capitalist industrial agriculture is exhausting the soil, destroying the life-giving connection to land and creating a crisis of providing food for the planet's people. Un limited wealth accumulation collides with ecological limits. Unlimited capitalist exploitation and destruction of nature is leading to a collapse of ecological systems and eventually a collapse of civilization. The drive for maximum profits compels capitalists to force externalities and waste onto nature and society. Profits are privatized and waste is socialized. These are overhead costs and, and they retard economic and social development. For example, the IMF reported that 5.2 trillion a year in externalities from fossil fuel companies uh, are expended globally from fossil fuel companies. The US and China economies both saddled the world with 1.8 trillion dollars or sat have saddled the world economy with 1.8 trillion dollars in economic losses between 1990 and 2014 due to damaging agricultural yields reducing labor productivity and curbing industrial output a significant part of the chinese contribution is by transnational corporations that have offshored their production to china the overhead cost of society also include dead and ill workers, enormous environmentally related healthcare costs, uninhabitable regions, brownfields and toxic waste sites, fertilizers to treat soil exhaustion, and increasing costs of adaptation to climate change. In 2022, the US alone experienced 18 separate weather and climate disasters, costing at least $1 billion each, including Hurricane Ian that killed 149 people, as I mentioned already. These extreme weather events, droughts, wave, uh, heat waves, wildfires, and floods will continue to grow in scale, and so will, cost, and so will the cost in lives and property. And then on top of that, we have the growing waste of the military budgets, and the largest green, which is the largest greenhouse uh, gas emitter, uh, and of course, armed conflicts and toxic waste sites that uh, you know crew from uh, wars and and so on. Um, U.S. imperialist aggression 
left environmental devastation in Vietnam with Agent Orange and massive bombing. And in Iraq, uh, there are now something like 11 million pounds of toxic waste, you know, strewn around the country. Uh, there were the burn pits, you know, uh, toxic burn pits that um, were, you know, a lot of thousands and thousands of U.S. veterans and Iraqi people, you know, uh, you know, develop cancer and so on. We are seeing widespread dis environmental destruction in Ukraine on the heels of the Russian imperialist aggression of that country. The capitalist mode of production is based on two principal contradictions rooted in the drive for maximum profits. The first, the contradiction between the forces of production and relations of production. Wealth is socially produced and privately appropriated by the capitalists. And the second contradiction is between the forces and relations of production and the conditions of unlimited economic growth and exploitation of nature's gifts conflicts with nature's finite resources and capacity to absorb waste and destruction. The exploitation degrades and destroys the conditions of production leading to the self-destruction of the forces of production and relations of production. Therefore, a falling rate of profit is the characteristic feature of capitalism. Climate change is impacting the rate of profit by reducing worker productivity and degrading free nature and the conditions of production. Capitalists constantly trying to reverse this falling rate of profit and increase wealth accumulation through monopoly pricing, expanding and dominating markets, and intensifying exploitation of both labor and nature. To in intensify exploitation, capitalists must eliminate environmental and workplace protections, crush organized labor, social justice movements, and democratic rights. But this only intensifies the, the environmental and social crisis climate apartheid and climate patriarchy. Therefore, capitalists would have to impose authoritarian or fascist rule to achieve this. And that's exactly what the most reactionary fractions of capital backing the MAGA and, and the Republican Party are seeking to do. Capitalism can reform itself within certain limits, but it cannot escape these basic contradictions. Because humanity includes production and exchange, institutions, classes, civil society, and so on. the ecological crisis is an existential crisis for civilization and for capitalism. The ecological social crisis solved in the confines of the system and therefore the necessity for a reorganization of society, a revolution of the production and for a social transformation on a planetary scale. The class struggle, a struggle for workers' rights, racial, gender, and, and identity equality, for democracy and a do, new democratic world order, and the environmental justice movement are all bound together. The climate and ecological crises are also creating economic, financial, societal, and political instability and disruption. A societal breakdown doesn't guarantee a good outcome, only creates the possibilities for societal transformation if and when the eco-conscious working class and its allies gains political supremacy. Political instability, confusion, and chaos also creates possibilities for the most reactionary sections of capital and right-wing fascist political movements to gain power, to block and reverse all progress and impose a dystopian authoritarian nightmare. Therefore, human agency is decisive. Instead of being scared of the climate crisis, we need to be scared of inaction. So I want to take a break here and throw open the um, floor for discussion. And my question is to all of you are, is are we doomed or can humanity address this 
a crisis and why is it easier for us to envision the end of humanity and nature than the end of capitalism so we want to take a, uh, about 10 minutes so we'll we'll open the floor for um you know for discussion here all right so i will be taking questions i'm Kay. i'll be moderating this section uh so if you want to speak uh you can click on the picture of the hand that should be present uh, and open your mic on your end by clicking on the picture of the microphone then you wait for your name to be called your mic will be opened on our end and then you can speak up and briefly introduce your comment or question <laughs> and we're going to ask that you keep it to a minute and we're going to get as many as we can and then let john respond so let me look at the list I have Corina, you may speak. Corina, we can't hear you. Uh, please make sure your mic is open. Karina, speak up if you want to. Okay, she closed her. Okay, speak up, Karina. Your mic is open. Please speak up. All right, Kay, you you might want to move to some some something's wrong. Yeah. Sorry about that, Karina. We'll move on, Jennifer. Uh, you may speak now. Jennifer, please open your mic so we may hear you. Okay, Jennifer, you have to use your okay. mouse. Uh, is the mic open? Yes. Is yes. the mic open? <laughs> Great. Hi, how are you guys doing today? Okay, how are you? Well, um, I was trying to get into an art conference, but I heard about this, and I wanted to speak out about um, something in Chicago where I used to live and how one might constructively resolve it, if possible. Are, you, you, responding? Can, you, Are you responding to the question that was put on the floor, Jennifer? Well, um, there are a lot of things that happen in a lot of cities, but... Uh, you might want to send us an email, but we don't have a lot of time. A lot of time. Now, but um, as far as your chat, um, I wanted to tell you that I think it's all universal, that we need to just go do something, because all of the people do the same kind of thing. They do it at Herc, in the Twin Cities, they do it at Hilco, they, they do it at um, BP at the refinery in Whiting, Indiana, and that's basically what I had to say, and... Um, I don't know. You have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll um, I think there are some other people that may want, want to speak, but thank you. Yes. We'll go ahead and take Joshua. Please unmute your mic. Hey, uh, you can hear me? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Um, you, uh, you asked about uh, being able to see people seeing the end of the world uh, before seeing uh, the end of capitalism. Um, in, on, on one end, I think there are a lot of people that are moving past this, um, though I do spend a lot of time in uh, alternative culture spaces. Um, but still, I see a lot of people progressing from, uh, uh, from these nihilistic views to more ex existential views, um, and to carry on into uh, views of existentialism, uh, both Nietzsche and Jung uh, address uh, that that archetypal viewpoint of uh, uh, within the culture. And so here, what we have is is this apocalyptic cult, especially in America, which is like the root 
of, of like capitalism in the world. And so people have people have spent thousands of years and, and the last 300 years very heavily focused on the apocalypse. And so that's deeply ingrained in what they expect out of the world and out of the future. And so for a lot of people, they think they, they can't even see beyond capitalism because their viewpoint of the world is uh, uh, the mark of the beast coming in uh, along with socialism. And uh, that is the end of the world. And thus for them, capitalism uh is the last is the last frame before it's in game okay thank thank you thank you for your comment yeah. all right next we'll take uh, mary oh hold on there we go you should be able to speak now can you hear me Hello. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Hi, John. How are you? Um, this is Mary from Texas. I just wanted to kind of add in, you know, I put the question as well, but I don't know if you saw it, but, you know, we have environmental racism going on as well. We have a lot of issues as far as um, concrete batch plants um, in the Fifth Ward area. We've had issues with um, finding cancer spots where black and brown people are getting cancer. So my question is, what do you think we can do to make awareness of this issue in poor working class communities where they have a higher rate of receiving cancer due to the, they have a lot of factories in poor areas. Um, I know where I am, it's concrete batch plants are one of the things that are very, is very dangerous. So that's my question, thank you. All right. Thank you, Mary. We will go to Len. Please unmute your mic. There you go. Oh, wait. You muted it again. There you go. Yes. Uh, first, I want to thank the presenter for uh, uh, everything we just experienced. Uh, are we doomed? Uh, no. Uh, as long as. Um, the uh, the party and the broad left embraces uh, the challenges that we face around climate change and all the other interacting uh, uh, challenges that the presenter went through. I think the reimagining of the peace movement, which is really a uh, very positive development uh, that the Communist Party is working on and hopefully will be this is going to be spreading out to the left and broader masses uh, is really important, but it has to involve the environmental movement. And, and I think, you know, we have an environmental movement now that's very broad. It reminds me of the peace movement in the 60s and 70s, but it doesn't have a left presence uh, enough uh, to create the atmosphere and push to make these very large changes uh, that we need. And the last question that the presenter made, uh, why are people more embracing doom than they are, you know, uh, seeing a, a, a light here uh, going forward is I think anti-communism and racism, uh, those twin ideologies, I, I certainly see it all the time uh, in the work um, in Connecticut uh, and in Maine and in other states, that we really have to make inroads on anti-communism, anti-socialism, and racism. Those ideologies, uh, or Cold War uh, to the second power that we're experiencing now, if we're really going to want change. But thank, I want to thank the presenter again. OK, thanks. Thanks, Len. Yeah, I think uh, that's probably all the time we have right now. If, we have some time at the end. We can come back to those who haven't had a chance to to weigh in. Um, so I'm going to probably respond to the questions in the course of the rest of the presentation. Um, so I hope you'll um, bear with me. And then um, 
I'll try to, if, if for whatever reason I didn't get a chance to, to, um, you know, respond to it, I'll try to try to work it in. But yeah, definitely. I mean, I, you know, there, just to, to respond to the issue of doom, um, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with building the movement and um, getting people in motion, you know, and uh, getting people active and engaged and connected and um, reaching people with the truth. Um, and as I'm going to mention here, we have all the tools to uh, decarbonize, you know, now it's really a matter of political will and building the movement, um, you know, to do that. So, um, so, but thank you everybody for your comments. Um, well, humanity must fight together or perish separately. We have confidence in our working class and humanity to save itself and nature and in the process reorganize society. But winning requires proper strategy and tactics that identifies and unites the key class and social forces, the multiracial working class, environmental justice, and other democratic movements in the first place into a massive and unstoppable alliance to save the planet. The strategic task of this alliance is to contest for governmental power, to be able to use the state at every level to implement a transition to clean energy, mitigation of uh, the climate, um, you know, the uh, uh, climate crisis and adaptation. That is, we have to, we're gonna have to adapt. There's no getting around it, you know, because of the um, greenhouse gas emissions in the pipeline and also the effects that we're experiencing to we're going to have to reorganize society or, or have help organize society to adapt itself to these changes. Um, and also, and then finally, to institute ecological uh, regeneration. That means utilizing mass protest and pressure and the existing political and democratic institutions and electing pro-climate champions and dem democratic majority governing coalitions at every level while transforming those institutions and creating new ones. Out of this movement can arise a mass transformative revolutionary movement for sustainable development, environmental justice, and socialism. The fossil fuel industry and finance capital, and I would add in there the military industrial complex and their massive right-wing political disinformation and brainwashing media machine is the main obstacle to decarbonizing the economy and society. This is one of the main pillars of MAGA, the extreme right and fascists, the assault on democracy, on equality, and the obstacle to progress on all fronts. <clears throat> Therefore, the obliteration of the extreme right and GOP and, their, and ousting them from, from office and from positions of power at every level is a historic imperative to save democracy, humanity, and nature. It is the main task of the class and democratic and environmental justice movements at this moment and a precondition for ex accelerating the green transition and progress on every other issue and of course this is the heart of the communist party usa strategic policy what will it take to limit global temperatures from rising 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade but at the same time overcoming underdevelopment and provide ample clean energy to every part of the globe. Net zero carbon emissions by 2050, especially of the two largest economies, the US and China. China, the United States, India, European Union, Indonesia, and the Russian Federation, and Brazil accounted for about half of all greenhouse, global greenhouse gas emissions in 2020. A group of 20 most industrialized nations 
uh, are responsible for about 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Decarbonizing energy systems, the transition uh, to renewables, that's going to, that's the, at the heart of this. Building, and it means building the world's largest uh, solar farm every day until 2030. It means all new vehicles electric by 2035, 40 million charging stations up from about a million a day. It means conservation. The global economy will, will double, but needs to use 8% less energy. It means protecting what we have. So this really important initiative called uh, protecting 30% of all land, fresh water, and oceans by 2030. It means uh, developing, uh, actually drawing down, you know, carbon from the atmosphere. That is promoting nature-based solutions like forests, grasslands, oceans that can remove about 80% of all carbon dioxide emissions. But this only 80%, you know, can, it results in continuous buildup of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but it, but with a expansion of forests, grasslands, natural areas, a regenerative, what they call regenerative agriculture, and restoring the health of the oceans um, can go a long way to uh, drawing down carbon. New technologies may be developed to extract CO2, but they often use enormous amounts of energy and cannot become an excuse to delay abolishing fossil fuels. We start with the real existing society, the global capitalist system, real class and social balance of forces, the existing civic, political, democratic institutions, movements, and where people are at in their thinking. There's much cause for hope to seems like insurmountable odds. Almost all the technology and science exists to completely decarbonize energy production. Second, market forces are rapidly driving down the cost of renewable energy, which are now cheaper to produce than fossil fuel energy. And by the way, which state do you think has the leading wind energy state? Of all states, it's Texas. The you know one of the reddest states in the country, yet it, it leads in wind energy production. Math and and one of the things that's being planned is a massive new offshore wind turbine project plan, which is supposedly have a footprint larger than uh, the city of Houston, which is pretty damn big. I've been down there. Uh, third, the transition would create 36 million jobs, 17 million more than today. United States, 10 million jobs with twice the investments uh, are being, investments for clean energy are being made in red states than in blue states, uh, which would offset all, you know, the loss of jobs in those states. Fourth, growing majorities demand action. This is becoming a much more, a much bigger issue, you know, as the uh, climate crisis develops, as people experiencing uh, you know, extreme weather events and, and uh, destruction, so on and so forth. Uh, fifth, major economies, including China and most of the largest U.S. states, have plans now to achieve net zero emissions for 2050. The fight to save humanity and, and nature requires global action governments, people, civic organizations, political parties, unions, tribal authorities, NGOs, and sections of the capitalist class and corporations. The modern US environmental movement arose in the 1950s and 60s in response to nuclear, industrial, workplace, and agricultural chemical pollution. The first Earth Day was held in 1970 and the agency was established there later that year. Now we're in a period where the environmental movement is exploding globally. Global co uh, collaboration began to address the climate crisis, began under the United Nations aus auspices with the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, 
adopting a global plan for sustainable development and establishing the IPCC, which is, you know, kind of monitors uh, and develops overall plans and so on. The Paris Accord was finally adopted in the year 2014. The ambitious goals and annou announced by countries at the Conference on Parties or what they call COP26 meeting in Glasgow in 2021 were a turning point, but not sufficient yet to keep temperatures from rising two degrees centigrade. The challenge is, is to build greater unity, larger movements, greater solidarity, and governmental action to overcome obstacles, fossil fuel and corporate, corporate interests to achieve equitable economic and cultural development for all, to build resilient communities, to adapt, and to respond to the climate disasters and refugee crisis. The good news is that 140 countries accounting for 91% of greenhouse gas emissions have proposed or set net zero targets for 2050. Eight small countries in the global south have already achieved net zero emissions. China will reach peak carbon emissions this year, seven years sooner than planned. Worldwide renewable power capacity will double by 2027 and renewable energy will pass coal as the largest source of electricity, generate, electricity generation by early 2025. Solar is the fastest growing energy technology in history and will completely displace fossil fuels from the entire global economy before 2050. Solar capacity is growing by 20% a year. All this, at this pace, it will be larger than the combined total of coal, gas, nuclear, and hydro by 2031. The world's energy, entire energy source would be decarbonized and enough energy produced for every country to achieve full economic development. I think this is the kind of thing that people need. They need to see that there's changes taking place and that um, the world is, and people are pulling together. And this gives you confidence that something can be done. Putting the United States on the path toward 100% clean energy, sustainability, and ecological regeneration rests on the class and political balance of forces in this country building a bigger mass pro-climate movement and a pro-climate, having a pro-climate White House, majorities in Congress and state houses and city councils. The U.S. bears a special responsibility because the U.S. economy is the world's top emitter of greenhouse gases per capita, although China is the largest aggregate emitter by country. And elections have consequences. The 2020 elections were a huge victory for advancing a pro-climate agenda and reversing the Trump disaster. The Biden administration, when it came into office, actually even before it came into office, was already collaborating with envir the environmental movement to develop what they called an all of government plan and legislation center centering the climate crisis elevating science, staffing positions with pro-ecology administrators, bolstering the EPA, and rejoining the, the global climate efforts. The Biden administration, in its plan, committed the U.S. to cut greenhouse gas emissions by over half over the tw uh, 2005 levels by the year 2030, and to reach uh, a net zero energy grid by 2035, and a net zero economy by 2050. Achieving this would be transformative and impact every area of work and life. During 2021 to 2022, and the first of the administration, the Biden administration and narrow Democratic majorities passed a triad of historic legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, the American Jobs and Infrastructure Act, and the CHIPS Act that poured almost $400 billion into funding programs and incentives to accelerate a, a clean energy transition. 
The America Jobs Plan, for example, also has climate-related investments to eliminate lead service lines and pipes to build electric vehicle charging stations. It's the largest investment in passenger rail since Amtrak. It funds resilient resiliency projects, especially in the most vulnerable neighborhoods. It funds, uh, you know, production of electric school buses and so on. But resistance, as we know, resistance to all the passage of this legislation was very fierce, and especially to undercut the EPA and the Clean Air Act um, through rulings by the Republican dominated and fossil fuel corrupted Supreme Court uh, and also red state governments. But important actions are also occurring at the at the federal city levels where environmental justice movements and alliance with democratic legislative movements prevail. 22 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, have plans to achieve net zero by 2050 along with 50 tribal governments. All are so-called blue or purple states except for Louisiana and Nebraska and comprise over half the population of the country. And over 130 U.S. cities have joined the 1,000 cities globally in the race pledge. States that have democratic trifectas, that is a democratic governor, democratic state legislature, including California, New York, Illinois, Massachusetts, and Minnesota, have gone the furthest. They serve as reminders why the MAGA dominated, uh, you know, MAGA uh, Republican Party that's down on fossil fuel interests must be out, ousted in state governments across the country. Again, the power of the vote, elections have consequences. Biden uh, signed numerous executive orders on climate, including the latest instructing federal agencies to use environmental justice guidelines and approving projects. The administration has developed a novel legal approach to regulate industry and awarding federal contracts by determining the real costs of industrial pollution for present and future generations and the savings that would accrue through a clean energy transition. Environmentalists continue to fight Biden's wrong policies, including in his approval of uh, you know, the Willow um, uh, project up in Alaska and also um, the recent pipeline um, concession that was made uh, to Joe Manchin. Um, but they also, they do this, the environmentalists, you know, fight these measures uh, while also pushing the administration to go further and declare a national emergency on climate. Biden could unlock presidential powers under a national emergency act and employ the defense Production Act and the Emergency Assistance Act, which would really unleash a, a lot more of the productive capacity of the country, you know, to uh, make this transition. The 2022 elections that we just experienced last year were the best showing of a president's in the mid its first midterm ever. The anti-MAGA majority, and there is an anti-MAGA majority in the country powered by mobilizations to defend reproductive rights, won big in battleground states. However, the, elected, the election resulted in a narrow uh, Republican House majority and divided government. And we had what we had with this struggle over the debt limit. Um, for the time being, you know, further advances on the climate agenda, you know, are stalled. It's very unlikely that anything else is going to get through Congress uh, until the 2024 elections. So the 2024 election is a battleground for advancing a pro-climate agenda. Our priority is to help mobilize the anti-MAGA, anti-racist, pro-climate majority to re-elect Biden and Democratic majority majorities in the House and Senate electing more 
first elected officials electing an anti-filibuster majority in the Senate um, and being able to, you know, elect a, a, a Democratic majority Senate to be able to appoint progressive justices throughout the federal judiciary, including the Supreme Court, when, you know, vacancies uh, become, uh, when vacancies open up, and to continue to accelerate the clean energy transition. A lot of stuff that wasn't done in the last uh, Congress, you know, can be done with bigger majorities, uh, you know, if, if we're successful in 2024. A bigger victory can reverse what was lost, including the cancellation of the Willow Project and the Mountain Valley Pipeline, and to allow a far more robust and expansive role for the state. The climate crisis, as I mentioned before, is shifting public opinion and laying the basis for bigger defeats for MAGA across the board. Uh, because, you know, it's not just the climate issue, it's reproductive rights, it's voting rights. Um, you know, it's a whole bunch of issues that, are, uh, you know, issues of gun violence. There's big majorities on all of these issues and the MAGA and the Republican Party are on the wrong side uh, and are really isolating themselves more and more um, with their extreme policies. 54% see climate change as a major threat, including 80% of Democrats and independents, whereas only 23% of Republicans see it as a major threat. 70% of Americans, 90% Democrats and independents favor net zero by the year 2050 only 44 percent of republicans favor it and I, I think again this reflects the power of the right-wing brainwashing media you know um that has a hold on tens of millions of our american citizens fellow american citizens uh brainwashing them uh with uh you know lies and disinformation 24 hours a day the environmental justice movement is pouring more resources into voter mobilization you know, one of the most critical voting blocks are young voters, and the environment is a top issue among young people. By age group, youth support Democratic candidates highest, but vote least. If more youth voted, the, you know, MAGA as a political force would be toast in this country, uh, would be ousted in uh, many, you know, states and so on all across the country. A big vote registration and mobilization drive is being planned among young voters for 2024 which is very exciting environmental first voters uh turnout is also critical especially in rural areas and red states um and that's another way to to help to you know break uh because these include republican voters um who are very concerned about environmental issues and just peeling them off will also has the chance of making many more so-called red states and districts very competitive another critical area of struggle is the battle of ideas the fossil fuel industry and right wing massively fund disinformation to sow division and delay the clean energy revolution uh, as part of like a much bigger disinformation uh, campaign you know by the right, what I call the right wing propaganda uh, disinformation machine uh, that includes like Fox and Newsmax and the rest of them. Um, but, you know, as, as I said, they have tens of millions of people under their sway and are brainwashing them in this like bubble. 70% um, of this disinformation comes from what is what are called or what's been dubbed the toxic 10. These are 10 right wing media outlets um and and behind that is mostly oil and gas companies um you know who are feeding this disinformation uh there's also two outlets of russian state media that also are in this toxic 10. it's no accident that republicans and those brainwashed by right-wing propaganda think the way they do but it spills over you know, into other areas of uh, thinking and life and so on. Greenwashing is, is another insidious 
form of disinformation. And it's, you know, obviously connected with this other thing. But some of the things that greenwashing also involves uh, and some of the ideological things are what we talked about earlier, this sense of fatalism and doom, there's nothing you can do about it. And that that's very purposeful, you know, to demobilize people. <clears throat> Second is, you know, climate denialism ongoing for a long time now. And these oil companies knew, know that they're doing it, they have known that they're doing it, and, uh, that, that uh, you know, the climate crisis is real and global warming is real. They know they've known that for decades, but they, you know, they've they've obviously uh, buried it and 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 used this climate denialism as a way to get past it. Uh, this idea of uh, carbon capture, you know, that, that we can find a way to capture the the carbon and continue to burn fossil fuels and bury this carbon in the ground, uh, which is very expensive and you know, in any case, it it creates more, uses up more energy than it actually is able to, uh, you know, be effective to, at, uh, you know, bearing this stuff. Uh, the idea of green hydrogen, same thing, uses up a lot of energy and so on. Uh, the idea of all of the above strategy, that is, while we transition, we have to continue burning fossil fuels and producing uh, solar and wind and and so on. No, we have to get we have to get rid of fossil fuel fossil fuels. We have to uh, abolish the fossil fuel industry. Uh, but that's a, again that's another ideological uh, poison you know that they're injecting into the body politic. Human civilization is under a compressed time frame to transition to a green. To, to green energy. The process of decarbonizing can't wait for socialism. It must occur under real conditions, the real balance of forces and dominant, dominant capitalist mode of production, institutions, real po political institutions, the whole system. This superstructure can be transformed in revolutionary ways during the struggle to decarbonize, adapt, and implement environmental justice. Saving humanity and nature requires the mobilization of societies and an enormous role for the state, including in abolishing fossil fuels, mobilizing and redirecting resources, and expanding the public sector and the global companies. The state must be an arena of contested struggle by the working class, organized labor, mass democratic and environmental justice movements, Utilizing federal, state, and local governments is essential to addressing this crisis, implementing pro-ecological policies and summoning its immense resources, making sure no community is left behind. The government can pass laws and issue regulations curbing the power of corporations for the common good, and especially protecting the most vulnerable and discriminating communities and taxing the wealthy. Different ruling class factions and political coalitions are contesting for supremacy of the state. The multiracial working class, its mass democratic movements have to, have to fight the bourgeois state, but also pressure and transform the state, democratize it in its role in this crisis. Altering the state to be a force in the transition to sustainability is a critical part of the democratic phase of the struggle for socialism. A step toward the working class employing, as, Mar as Engels said, quote, its political supremacy to wrest by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie. A new balance of forces can arise and possibilities arise for transition into socialism. The US and state governments have a history of immense infrastructure pro projects impacting economic development. Just think of the Erie Canal, the interstate highway system, and the uh, Works Project Administration during the Depression. The direct investments and incentives embodied in the triad of legislation that I mentioned earlier that was Congress are in that class. 
through the power of procurement, the federal government has enormous leverage to accelerate the development of markets to scale up production. And this is exactly what the Biden administration is doing. Historically, procurement went through military production and military planes to commercial airlines, tanks to tractors and chemical worker agents to fertilizers, funding research into processors and the PC consumer market and the internet. Federal, state, and local government comprise something like 38% of gross domestic product. Federal government is, the federal government is the largest consumer of energy and vehicles and the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. The federal government has $600 billion a year in purchasing power and can use the big green buy to drive transformation. Under Obama and the Biden administration, the government began buying electric vehicles for its 600,000 vehicle fleet and installing solar panels and electric heat pumps on 430,000 leased and owned federal buildings. The Postal Service is replacing 40% of its fleet with electric trucks after a lot of protest. Um, the EPA is providing grants for 400 school districts to purchase 2,500 electric school buses. And the Interior Department is utilizing immense federal lands for wind, solar, and geothermal projects to restrict logging and promote reforestation and to open offshore areas to wind farms. The Department of Defense is the world's, is the world's largest institutional user of petroleum and correspondingly the single largest institutional producer of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. A new stage of globalization characterized by cooperation and solidarity on climate, disease prevention, economic development, and economic development would remove, completely remove the justifications for such a large military presence globally. Can the Department of Defense be transformed into a climate force that responds to emergencies and extreme weather events and assists in disasters wherever they occur. As communists, we fight for a sustainable, regenerative, democratic, and demilitarized society. Environmental justice is the fight to close the wealth gap and also the, not only between rich and poor, but between um, the African-American and other communities of color and, and, and white working class communities. Investing in a green transition domestically and globally requires massive funds. They can be taken by transferring from the military budget and taxing capitalists for reparations here and globally. Communists fight and others in the environmental justice movement for a just transition, Ret retraining for jobs lost as fossil fuel energy sec as the fossil fuel energy sector is liquidated, massive reparations and investment in multiracial working class communities and historically discriminated against communities, and those who have been who have borne the brunt of environmental racism and injustice for union wages and protections. Our fight is to ensure labor and communities of color are decision makers. And the AFL-CIO is like really in the forefront of, all, of this now, along with civil rights organizations and others. And it kind of, it says that every organization uh, like labor, civil rights are also environmental justice organizations. The transition to clean energy will create over 36 million jobs globally including uh, 2.3 million jobs in the United States. And of course, we're gonna fight to make sure these are union jobs. But much more is needed. There's a lot of greenhouse gas emissions in the pipeline. Even reaching net zero, the effects of new em emissions will impact the climate for decades, if not hundreds of years to come. Massive investments are also in resilient housing, in infrastructure, ecological restoration, 
public health systems, including universal health care, mass transit, and revolutionizing the agricultural system, a major uh, carbon emitter by breaking the power of agribusiness and converting to a regenerative cyclical cooperative agricultural model. Rethinking urban spaces and how we live, recreate and work also has to be a part of this. We fight for solidarity. Mobilizing the mobilizing power and resources of the federal, state, and local governments are needed for adaptation and resiliency, resiliency planning to address the climate induced social upheaval, including resettling climate refugees here and globally. There's a lot of the refugees who are coming to the US border with Mexico from Central America are fleeing a, a climate crisis there and this is just the beginning <laughs> therefore we have to find you know it's a it's a real test for us you know what kind of solidarity can, are we going to be able to display as a country as a as a working class and people um, because this is going to get much worse uh, in the years to come entire coastal and not just from other other places other countries but also internally entire coastal cities metro and travel communities are threatened by sea level rise, flooding, wildfires, and therefore uh, the number of refugees globally and also domestically is going to increase dramatically. Change radically to adapt to, cl to, to climate change while the economy is decarbonized and nature's balance is restored. All these require deeper, more economic and structural reforms. Environmental justice demands demilitarization, global cooperation, new era of globalization and radically democratic governance and solidarity if we are to survive. Our motto has to be all for one and one for all. Environmental justice means leaving no one behind, it means reparations, funding the green transition, economic development and adaptation assistance in the global south. It means solidarity with the planet's most vulnerable, including the 1.2 billion at climate risk and the 500 million projected climate refugees. The global south and developing economies add the least to greenhouse gas emissions, but they suffer the brunt of the effects. Environmental justice means deepening democracy at the workplace and in society cooperation and solidarity. The transition to a sustainable society, expanding grassroots democracy, engagement, collaboration, and participation. People must determine what's best for their communities and have the full authority to carry out decisions. Environment, environmental justice is about expanding democratic rights, a clean environment for all, at home, at work, and protecting the rights of nature. Green transition and cheap, the cheap cost of renewables makes possible alternative paths uh, without fossil fuels, including socialist-oriented paths. 20th, 21st century socialism has to be a champion of environmental justice and a new solidarity and cooperative society and a revolutionized circular waste-free production process while also at the same time acknowledging the horrible environmental damage of previous many of the previous socialist experiments. The early Soviet Union ecology in the 1920s under Lenin, the Soviet Union led the world in environmental protection, conservation and ecological science. That ended under Stalin, giving way to destructive ideology, to the destructive ideology and policy of man's domination of nature and developing productive forces at all costs. In China, the Chinese um, Communist Party is leading the way with a, what they call building an actual civilization and at the same time addressing the environmental destruction that accompanied its development over the past 40 years. 
in Cuba, Terea Vida, that is life task. The world's leading is the, is the world's leading experiment in organic farming. Uh, the Cuba is you know e ecological policy is for increasing for the forestry coverage of the of the island to 33 percent, and for protecting the entire coastline. Uh, and they have a goal of 24 percent of electricity from renewable energy by the year 2030. Uh, these are not socialist countries, but in Ecuador and Bolivia, indigenous worldviews that prioritize harmony with nature over economic development have been enshrined in law and the Ecuadorian constitution, including the concept of the rights of nature. We are at an inflection point in human his and natural history. Late stage capitalism has really created interlocking crises on a global scale the system cannot solve. Crises like climate, democracy, wealth and social inequality, public health, militarism and conflict, and also technological displacement. Now, you know, this uh, AI, uh, which uh, some, some of the developers think is, a, is an existential threat for humanity as well. Capitalism's destruction of the environment is one of the most important factors creating a mass anti-capitalist radicalization, especially among youth, in an understanding of its interconnection to other issues of income, inequality, racial and gender oppression, and militarization. The struggle to decarbonize and save the planet is helping shape a new mass socialist movement for a new U.S ecological socialist order, a new relationship between society and nature, a demilitarized people-powered democratic socialism in which the balance between humanity and the rest of nature is restored. The solutions to this socio-economic ecological crisis also intersect and must be addressed simultaneously. This is our path to sustainable, democratic, peaceful, socialism. I always end with a, this quote because I like it so much. People are determined they can overcome anything. Nelson Mandela. And that concludes the presentation. So we have a few minutes now. I want to open up the floor again for additional comments, thoughts, or questions. I think we have a little bit of time. So remember, if you want to ask a question, click the raised hand icon and we'll be able to see that and unmute your mic and prepare to have your name called. Uh, and we'll try to get to you. We'll start, uh, Corina, let's give you another chance. Please unmute your mic. If you click the microphone icon on your end, you will be able to speak. I'm not seeing that you've unmuted your mic, Corina. All right. Let's move to something like this. Uh, Keenan, I have unmuted your mic. All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Um, I was just going to say, uh, I, was, I wanted to make an answer to the second part of the question, which is why can people not envision an end to capitalism? And uh, to try to put this quickly, I think it kind of boils down, in my opinion, um, I have a degree in physics. I also work in computer science. So um, I think it's because people generally do not know what materialism is, and they don't understand why capitalism is not material. Um, I think in some sense they do because we talk about sustainability often in our media and referring to why our economy is not sustainable, but a lot of people don't understand the connection, which is that sustainable means that the economy does not uh, conform to material uh, limitations in nature. Um, and as well, um, 
a lot of propaganda regarding capitalism is kind of ubiquitous in our culture. We're taught it from, from a very young age. So a lot of people, um, for example, a lot of capitalist supporters and capitalists will like to throw numbers out at people. I think a really good example is that they will try to appeal to efficiency. But a lot of people don't understand that efficiency is actually an arbitrary quantity because it's a ratio of inputs to desired outputs. And that's a critical part of the definition of uh, efficiency, which is that it is desired outputs and inputs. So all you have to do is desire different outputs to change that quantity. And if people understood that, I think it's helpful in disarming the typical arguments that a lot of capitalists like to make to that end. All right, we'll move yeah, on you. to Melissa. I've unmuted your mic. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, John. Um, I think it's the working class um, culture there. Uh, they're waking up until all the issues and things that are that are important to them. Um, so I think that as they begin to learn about um, the climate and understand the importance of it, they'll come around um, just like they did, that they're doing now. You see a lot of unions and um, um, the young people, they're, they're stepping up and fighting for, for their, for the issues that are there, that are there, there that they are concerned about. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Next, we will go to uh, Ugo. I've unmuted your mic. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I went into this class thinking that we were going to get a Marxist analysis of capitalism and why it locks us into this cycle of environmental exploitation. And I, I'm not sure that's what we got. Um, the, is we talked about needing to be in solidarity with the global south, but we do not talk about the consequences of mining lithium and cobalt for the global south, which is extremely exploitative and, and toxic to the environment. And it's, just building electric cars is not the way forward. We have to invest in public transportation in rail uh, on a level that uh, surpasses even China at this point. We have to build out public transportation so that it's rail, so that there's more rail saturation than there was in the 19th century. These are not things that we can reasonably expect from Democrats. I understand that we have to support Democrats in this election to keep the fascists from getting control of, of government. But we have to be realistic about what the expectations are for Dems in, in government. It is more likely that we get a revolu that, that we get a revolution than 60 senators in the in the Senate that will do anything about this. That's the record. Uh, it's it's more there's the CP if the CPC had a 50 seat majority in the in the House, it's still unclear that they would do anything about this given their record. So uh, I'm just there was no mention of, of nuclear of of nuclear power. Mining cobalt and lithium is magnitudes more toxic for the environment than nuclear power is. And that's the only thing that has the energy density to, to really replace fossil fuels in the next 10 or 15 years. I, I don't, uh, I'm sorry if you're getting fired up about this, but uh, I just, I feel like I heard a Biden stump speech this whole this whole time, rather than what we as communists can do to organize around uh, Dems and and get this stuff into action. So it looks like we have about five minutes left. So let's allow our presenter to respond and close. 
Uh, yeah, well, thank thank you for your your comments. And again, I uh, you know I had a, at the beginning a disclaimer that you know I couldn't cover everything, and so I appreciate um, the contributions um, and uh, you know the points that were made even by the last uh, the last speaker. Um, yeah, I mean the whole the whole point is I think we we want to continue to as organizers and as a movement to continue to shift the balance of forces, you know, in the country. And the fact that, you know, the um, Biden administration and Democrats were able to achieve what they did with a very narrow majority in Congress in the last go around, uh, you know, we shouldn't downplay that. That was really an important uh, achievement, putting us on a, on a certain path. Now the challenge is how to deepen that, how to extend it, uh, how to incorporate some of the things that um, the speaker was saying. Um, so you know, I, I I agree with that. Just in terms of nuclear power, I don't think that that's a uh, in the cards. You know, uh, from the planning stage to actual building of a nuclear power plant, it takes 18 years, um, and actually building them, like the one they, a couple of them they built down in Georgia requires enormous amounts of energy. Um, and we don't have that kind of time, uh, you know, so converting to solar, wind, hydro, you know, is the is the way to go. And we have to continue to expand that revolution. Um, yeah, and, and Melissa was talking about some of the changes and, you know, not only among young people and other sectors of the population, but the labor movement. I mean, 10 years ago, the labor movement was not in a position to lead this thing. Um, but if you listen to Liz Schuler now, she's a full-throated um, supporter, you know, of this transition to green energy and to and the labor movement actually being at the table and helping to lead it uh, all across the country. So to me, these things give a lot of hope, you know? Uh, there's motion, there's uh, not only you know, uh, through our elected officials, but also the mass movements. Uh, at every level, there's motion, and that gives people confidence. Um, you know that things can can change, and we have the, as I said, we have the 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 solutions. Um, it's a matter of the political will, and that's I think where we come in. Uh, not only the party, but also you know the environmental justice movement, all of the movements, uh, the working class. Um, and people, the mass democratic movement, uh, we just have to make continue to make, to build eco consciousness uh, to make sure that we can actually uh, achieve that. So, anyway, thank you again for uh, joining us tonight, and um, you know, hope left some things to think about. And I'm sure we'll have many more discussions about this in the coming months and years. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Kay. We hope everyone will join us for Thursday night's class, which will be on China. And Saturday's two classes will be, uh, one will be a rousing discussion, I'm sure, uh, concerning uh, party, uh, party policy, party program, and how to continue to build uh, movements in the afternoon. So again, thank you, John. Thank you, Kay. And we hope everyone will join us again Thursday night, Thursday evening and Saturday morning and afternoon. Have a good evening.